Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final hour of Fusion 2020. In just a moment, we'll hear from our CEO and founder, John Baker. 30 minutes from now, we'll put a bow on the whole Fusion experiment with the grand finale of the Superpower Spotlight. That's a talent show for D2L customers and employees. I first met John Baker almost 18 years ago. I attended a Little League baseball game, and the first baseman really made an impression. I talked to him, and he told me that he had started an education software company called Desire to Learn. I thought that was pretty amazing for someone so young. Well, guess what? He's still very young, and he's still a pretty amazing guy. John will share some of his thoughts, and we'll follow that up with a question and answer period, so get your questions ready. Now, I hope that he says something like, thanks for that introduction, Barry, which will be his message to me that my job is still safe here at D2L. <laughs> Take it away, John. Please welcome President and CEO of D2L, John Baker. Thanks for that introduction, Barry. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I have the privilege of being able to join you today from our office. And I know it's a really busy time of the year for everyone, so I appreciate you taking some of your time today to be here. It matters. You know, it's been said that there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are years where decades happen. And it's hard to believe that it's only been about a year since that first COVID case was reported. In the past few months, a lot has happened. We've experienced a second wave of COVID across the globe, political change in the US, and continuing economic disruptions. And yet, 2020 looks like it's going to end on a high note because there's good news on the horizon with a vaccine. So, if we all take sensible precautions to be safe, there's a really good chance that we could all be back together again, maybe to even do fusion again in person in the not too distant future. And wouldn't that be awesome? Now folks, like everyone else, I've had to get used to doing things a little differently in 2020. Now, when I go to work, it looks a lot more like the Brady Bunch or Hollywood Squares. And when I get groceries, I line up outside the store and someone brings me my groceries. And when I tell a joke on a Zoom call, I can't hear anyone laugh. Actually, maybe that part hasn't really changed so much at all. Folks, uh, we've also been doing Fusion differently this year too. Not only do we do it online, uh, we have stretched it out over a few more months, which means Fusion can be really timely and responsive to this fast changing world we live in. So thank you for being with us throughout this journey. We started this conference by speaking about heroes uniting, about what happens when heroes get together and try to save the world. And you'll remember that we said that each of you are the heroes. Well, we're going to end fusion by taking the time to think about the heroism of hope we're going to end 2020 on a high note and head into the holidays and to the new year by looking at all that we have to be hopeful about in the future. We're going to talk today about three things. We're gonna talk about the hope that we feel when heroes arise, about the hope that happens when heroes act, and about the hope that drives us and inspires us when heroes inspire. But before we do that, let's talk about that word, hope. It's a really strong word. It's not a weak word, like wish. It's not about being passive and just sitting around and waiting for the world to change on its own. The word hope comes from the late Old English word, hopa, which means confidence in the future. So let's be hopeful. Let's actually lean into that definition to be filled with confidence because it's pretty heroic. And you should be confident because of everything that I've seen you achieve over the past year, all the obstacles you've overcome. You didn't quit. 
you kept education going for millions of learners all around the world, which has filled me with confidence too because of what I've seen you do and your action that you've taken. This year, I saw heroes arise. And that brings me to my first point. Folks, let's remember, we've been in this for some time now. We've learned a lot. And we know one of the critical keys to success is to be resilient, to keep bouncing back no matter what the circumstances throw at us. And in education, resiliency is key. We have to keep bouncing back. It goes without saying that if you put a society's learning on hold, you put the future at risk. You put the future of children at risk. And it's hard to recover from that. But it's not enough to just react. Resiliency, true resiliency, takes planning and effort and leadership which is why I think we need to refocus on some big questions. Questions that our leaders and policymakers are only now starting to turn their attention to. Like, how can we make it possible for kids to go to school and back home and back to school and back home? All with minimal disruption to their education. Or how can we ensure that all parents, especially parents working in the trades or retail or in our hospitals or on the front lines, how can you and I make sure that their kids are safe and learning when those important people are away from home, at work, helping us? It seems to me that if they're looking out for us, we should be looking out for them. And on the flip side, how can we make sure that people who are working from home can stay productive when their kids are also learning from home, perhaps even on a shared device? And how do we make sure that workers can still learn and advance in their careers? Well, we're not at the office. Because we can't afford to fall behind economically either, especially right now. So we need heroes to arise who can help us do better than day-to-day -day planning. We need heroes to build resilient systems and supports that allow us to navigate these waves of COVID and into the future. And while educational technology can do its part, it's only one part of the answer. Deciding what resiliency, pandemic-proof societies look like and how we achieve it has to be our collective priority in the months ahead. And that means bouncing back in some ways, but it also means building anew and challenging what is and looking at what could be. The news is, well, I think the good news is, that's happening. That's what I've seen coming out from both the G20 summit and the recent World Economic Forum COVID action platform. But closer to home, I'm seeing this start to happen in our schools and businesses. And that's an area where we can influence. We all have a role to play helping to build resilient systems that support learners and their families. I'm hopeful that, by that I mean I'm confident that we'll be resilient and focus on skilling and upskilling our digital workers and helping people get back on their feet. And that brings me to my second point about the hope that happens when heroes act. Of course, one of my favorite heroes of action is Batman. Because Batman doesn't wait around for things to happen. He sees the bat signal and springs into action. And what I like the most about him is that he's human. He uses his smarts to stay one step ahead of everyone. And yes, he's supported by a lot of technology, but it's how he uses that technology that's important. Batman is a digital superhero for a digital world. And digitization is everywhere. I don't have to tell you that. As educators, you've taken some major steps forward in that world this year. But it's not just learning that's being pulled forward technologically into time. It's the whole world that is at a digital crossroads. And I want to take a moment to explore what that means, because it's really important context. 
First is the fact that for some of our sectors of our economy, we've seen them be really hard hit, whether that's small businesses in our communities or the hospitality sector or others. This pandemic is also not finished with us yet. It will still shut down more businesses and put more people out of work. But at the same time, the economy is undergoing a digital transformation. Up until last year, folks, just to give you the picture in terms of numbers, the digital sector was about 12% of a worldwide economy. And that's nothing compared to what's coming next. In the next three to four years, 50% of the global economy is gonna become digital or digitally transformed enterprises. That's a $38 trillion transformation of the economy. Think of the industrial revolution sped up on steroids. There is not gonna be one part of our economy that will not be digital going forward. Buying food, digital. Buying a car, digital. Owning a home, picking out a new TV, getting a, a new dog for the family, which by the way, we've, we've done, <laughs> ordering a pizza, or you name it, every part of your life is all going to have a digital component. And there's two ways that we can look at this. We can see this as a threat and recoil, or we can see this as an opportunity and run towards it. But either way, it is inevitable. So the question is, how are we gonna use this moment in history to build a better education system and a better world. And folks, that starts with you. Your job is to get and help those students be ready for what comes next, to set them up for success. The digital economy is where success is going to be, and you're shaping it right now. All of that digital transformation starts in your classroom today. It may not feel like that right now, but you've taken some pretty big steps already. Educators have been digitizing learning for a long time now, for the last 20 years or more. And as we take these next important steps, as we expand that experience, we need to continue to optimize that experience for your learners and for you. And when we do that, and when we get it right, technology will help transform the educational experience for learners. And that is really exciting. And at its very best, you know what it will do. It will humanize learning. It'll give educators more time to connect with learners one-on-one, -on -one, more room in their schedule to care for them and focus on their well-being, and to help them get on the right track for success, to lift them up, and above all else, it will help you do what you do best, inspire them, help them achieve more than they ever dreamed possible. The best part is, you don't need to work too hard to open up learners to this idea, they're living in it. And if you don't believe me, just ask yourself, which member of your family do you turn to for tech support? I bet it's your kid. Our kids can see this opportunity. And we have a responsibility to be heroes for them. And it's not enough to just see the challenge. We need to act, we need to lead. And that brings me to my final point about the hope that happens when heroes inspire. And for heroes to inspire, they need to have a clear vision, a sense of moral purpose. The best leaders and heroes know the right thing to do and the right words to inspire people to act. And that's because they've always had their sights set higher on the future. And that's hard to do sometimes, I understand that. It's hard to lift your heads up when we're, and focus our sights on the horizon when we're battening down the hatches and dealing with challenges every day. Because for the last year, we've been reacting to COVID instead of acting. It's been exhausting because we can only make plans day at a time. And when we're constantly adjusting and shifting as circumstances change around us, hoping in many cases for just simply a return to normalcy, I feel like it's been a year where it's felt like we've been walking through a fog, only able to see a few feet in front of us. And we keep hoping that in a few more steps, the fog will lift and it will go back to normal and we'll be able to see clearly into the future. Well, 
let's be really honest with ourselves about that future. Because the truth is, it's going to look a whole lot different from the past. And as I said, the world is digitizing fast. And that means that for a lot of us, what we take for granted today is gonna to be very different tomorrow. And we want that different to also be better. And so we need to have a clear vision and confidence to build that future. We can't simply just wish for it to happen. We need to create it based upon the values that we hold dear. Values like equal access to opportunity. We need to build a new normal where all kids can learn from home or in the classroom. Not just the kids from white collar parents or in rich countries. We need to close the social economic gaps and wealth inequality that already exists. We can't create a class of digital have nots. I know these are not just educational issues. They're also economic and equity issues. They're also issues of fairness. And fairness demands that every learner everywhere can learn and succeed in this new world that is racing towards us. So how do you and I help make that happen? Well, it begins with a shared vision. And that's what I want to leave you with. I believe our shared responsibility is to help build a new digital world that is more fair, more just, more democratic, and with greater opportunity for more people. And to do that, we need to make decisions, big and small, to lead to outcomes that we desire, rather than simply hoping that things unfold. We need to approach this with confidence, which as we know, is the true meaning of hope. And as we bring 2020 to a close, I'm thinking of the poet Tennyson and what he once wrote. Hope smiles from the threshold of the year to come, whispering, it will be happier. My hope for you, no matter where you are, is that the new year brings you and your loved ones and family, health, happiness, peace and joy. And that we can see one another again, face to face, in 2021. Thank you and enjoy Fusion. That was awesome, John. So, you know, it's the question and answer time. So I'm going to throw a little curveball here because the first question that's come in is actually from Laura. And Laura is asking, who are the prize winners? <laughs> that's a good one, Laura. <laughs> so this is what happened, John. The last three days, we've been uh, having them fill out a poll question. Uh, it says something like, uh, whenever a face-to-face -face fusion is possible again, you know, fingers crossed, knock on wood, all that stuff. Where should we go? What city? So we got a couple hundred responses to that question. And I said, we'd randomly draw some winners. So here's the five winners. By the way, we'll contact you via email. So uh, stay tight. You'll hear from us. But Wendy McElroy, who, by the way, suggested Toronto. Nikki Davis, who suggested Charleston, South Carolina. I'd love to go there. Great city. Don Walker. <laughs> yeah, Don Walker suggested Vancouver. Awesome. Oh. <laughs> Jeff Allison said LA, Los Angeles. Um, we were gonna go to Anaheim this year and that's as that's close right. to Los Angeles as we were probably going to get, but it's right there. And um, Holly Fjok said Indianapolis, which uh, wasn't probably on our radar screen. So just uh, to wrap this up, there were a few other kind of interesting so, uh, suggestions like Helena, Montana, <laughs> Makina, Maui. And Anchorage, Alaska. So we, we do have lots of possible locations. All right. So are you ready for a real question? I am, Barry. <laughs> All right. Well, this one's Thanks. actually for you, John. This one sort of cuts across K-12 schools, higher ed, and the workplace. So what are your thoughts about STEM fields, or maybe the more modern STEAM fields of study? Do you think there will continue to be more demand for STEAM-type students in the future? Yeah, uh, I think the, the quick answer is yes. 
you know, I th uh, as I spoke about earlier, you know, we're seeing a huge transformation of every every sector of our economy uh, as we embrace digital, and that transformation is going to require us to shift our talent. And so, uh, you know, new graduates coming out of these STEAM programs, and by the way, I like the A uh, in there, not just because I'm a Canadian. Uh, but because it really does speak to the problem solving, the creativity, the empathy, all of these durable skills uh, that we need these STEAM uh, graduates to have to really be able to tackle the problems that we've got in front of us. Uh, and, and from all the data that I'm looking at and in all the conversations that I'm having with CEOs of companies all over uh, the world, uh, these skills are going to be in higher demand uh, today <laughs> than they even were just uh, nine months ago. No question. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna mix in a few um, less education questions with the education and training related questions as they come in. So Sue wants to know how old your kids are now and what they're asking for Christmas. <laughs> uh, great question, Sue. Uh, so I've got three little girls now, uh, four, three, and one. Uh, so the one-year-old really has not articulated what she wants for Christmas. Uh, the four-year-old wants a box of candy canes <laughs> uh, and the uh, the three-year-old wants uh, a rider uh, uh, caricature. I don't know if you know Ryder from Paw Patrol, but uh, she's a fan. <laughs> well, that's great. So let's stay on the kids idea. So many of the younger kids were thrust into remote learning real quickly back in the spring. Yeah. How can we better support those kids who are new to remote schooling in K-12 and kind of thinking specifically about mental health of the kids in the younger grades and starting new school experiences and circumstances they're not familiar with? And what are your thoughts here? Well, I, I think we, we radically, radically have to simplify the experience for these young students. Uh, you know, I, I know I've talked to a, a lot of parents that have had their kids having to log into eight or nine different applications just to, to make their way through uh, the actual education that they're going through. That's a challenge, especially for young kids. Uh, we also need to think about how do we actually support uh, families where there might be multiple kids at home uh, together trying to learn off of a shared device. Uh, so the uh, the concept that we're doing right now where we're doing it synchronously doesn't really work very well uh, long term uh, for every kid in every ho household. So when we think about equity and inclusion and trying to pull all these kids in, that makes a big difference. And then uh, and then what you refer to around wellness and making sure that we you know focus first on care and wellness for our students uh, has to be always paramount. Uh, I think this pandemic has really uh, underscored for us the need for us to make sure that we take care of each other, work, work with each other, and make sure we're looking out for each other. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm really proud of what I've seen within our client base in terms of making sure that that's, that is the number one priority as they walk into those either virtual classrooms or face-to-face -face classrooms. Hope that really continues as we go forward in the future. Thank you. So um, we started a bunch of new affinity networks this year with as part of Fusion. One of those is the competency-based learning network. So what is, what's the current state of the world of competency-based education uh, in workforce upskilling and retraining? And are institutions finally ready for this? Uh, they need to be. Uh, this is sort of like the, you know, if we talk about the three steps as you go from digitized to optimized to eventually get into these transformation layers, uh, it's a critical part of being able to support uh, students being able to catch up. So, uh, you know, if, if we look at this pandemic where we've got schools uh, that have not reopened either virtually or face-to-face -face globally. So those students for the last nine plus months have not been learning uh, in any, uh, you know, form whatsoever. And we need to do uh, things differently if we're going to help those students catch back up uh, and be able to progress in their education. Uh, to have a hope for going off to college or university uh, to be able to pursue their dreams. And so we need to do things differently and uh, mastery-based models of learning, uh, competency-based frameworks are one of those tools that we can use uh, that can help very clearly articulate to a student, here's what I'm expecting you to learn over a period of time. Uh, and as you demonstrate mastery, then you can progress forward. It gives you a real clear understanding as a student you know, where do I need to continue to work? Uh, what am I missing in terms of what gaps do I have? You know, we also need to back up and say, well, if you're in grade four and you miss some things in grade three, how do we get you the material for grade three uh, to help catch you back up and get you on the right uh, footing for progression? Uh, and, you know, I think 
10 years from now, we're going to look back at 2020 and uh, chuckle over how we used to evaluate students pre-rolling out these types of models. Because today, you know, as you know, every, every class is like this. You take all of the uh, scores for all the activities and you simply divide by the total and that's your score as a student. And that's how you progress. Uh, well, in the mastery based model world, you know, you, you see your progress being plotted over time. So you, you go from not knowing something <laughs> to starting to know it to really demonstrating true mastery and your evaluation reflects that. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a really different narrative uh, in terms of how we give feedback to students, have that conversation with parents. Uh, and I think it's going to be truly transformative. And I don't think this is just education, by the way. Uh, you know, a number of our clients uh, uh, in corporate space have embraced this model to really think about a modern way of doing compliance uh, to make sure that their people have the right skills to do the job that they're doing. Uh, you know, all, this is uh, going to be a transformation that ripples through every sector, no question. It's going to take time and work, uh, but uh, it does have a really big impact on the ability for people to have a better learning experience, which makes it worth it. Well, that, um, that dovetails right into a question that was asked by uh, uh, Zinat about um, mastery learning. Uh, he referred to your September 2019 blog on mastery learning and, and um, kind of wants to know what progress D2L has made on, on personalized learning pathways for either enrichment or remediation, but um, those that would lead towards the measurement of mastery learning and whether um, it's already in the works, how far down the road, or uh, what kind of timeline to expect? Yeah, well, great question. And you know, that's, that's funny that you asked that question. I was actually talking with John Bergman, who was the uh, person I was interviewing in that blog uh, back in 2019, yesterday. Uh, and we were discussing some of the things that we're actually launching this month uh, in the product, including a mastery view of Gradebook, which I think is the game changer. It's uh, it, it means that we can start pivoting from you know uh, the earlier frameworks that we built out around competency-based education tools to our new outcomes framework, which has a mastery view of the gradebook. And I, I think it's going to be a tremendous progress for our clients in terms of being able to you know uh, quickly pull in the standards or competencies or outcomes they want to align their courses to, align it very quickly to content, uh, uh, learning activities, to assessments, to quizzes, to assignments. And then very quickly uh, show progress, uh, you know, over time for those students, and be able to do those assessments uh, based upon, you know, even algorithms making the call, or, you know, really good evaluative judgment of the teacher. So, uh, you know, I think starting this December, as uh, that tool gets rolled out, it will be a, a real game changer. And then starting in January and onwards, every month you should see more updates to that uh, experience to make it even better. And then to also roll out uh, things for the administrators on the uh, the analytics side of uh, the house as well too. So I'm hopeful it'll be soon, Barry. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Uh, so we've reached the end of our of our Q and A time slot. We are uh, getting ready for the superpower spotlight, the the talent show that's going to end the whole thing. Um, I I will uh, introduce our our next little. Uh, shall we say, entertainment in just a second. But before I do that, John, give you a chance to uh, to address the audience one last time. Well, I just want to say thank you, Barry. Uh, you know, when you and Bree and the team came to me and said we want to do Fusion uh, six months in a row, <laughs> I had that I had that exact laugh. Uh, and, uh, you know, but uh, you said we're going to learn a lot when we do this. And it's going to be a great way for us to stay in touch with our clients through uh, a very challenging time. Uh, and you felt true to it. And I've been so impressed with the energy, the enthusiasm, the work uh, that you, uh, you and the team have put into making sure that our clients have a great experience over these uh, last six months. And the momentum continues to build with people, not just tuning in live, but also watching these things on demand. So really appreciate uh, all that you've done. I, I couldn't be prouder of the team. And I, and I couldn't be prouder of the hundreds of clients that have engaged, well, over 10,000 people that have engaged online uh, as part of Fusion. So. Uh, we've learned a lot and thank you for coming on this journey with us.